as an R&B music fan and collector since my teenage years, I've heard just about everything that Barry Gordy and Motown Records ever produced. And I know the words to almost every one of the songs that have ever been put out. In addition, songs that have come out, R&B songs that have come out of such places as Chicago and Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Since my teens, there's never been a time that I haven't enjoyed traditional R&B music. Lately though, perhaps as a, a function of age and life experience, I've begun to hear the music and the lyrics a little bit differently. I'm finding themes in a song that I've never heard before, a song that I may have heard literally thousands of times. This is particularly true for the R&B that was produced in the late 1960s and early 1970s when the theme of racial struggle was so prominent in the works of many of the artists and groups I knew. A theme at that time to which I was fairly deaf. Today I'm hearing the story of Mary and Joseph and God in a different way. A different way that I've ever heard throughout my life. I'm hearing a story of two people, most certainly in an arranged marriage, who were struggling to care for and about one another, and perhaps even to find love. American culture and media both load Christmas and load us with some intense expectations of family harmony and good cheer. The story of Mary and Joseph is not one of those stories. The first Christmas was anything but a story of flawless family values a tale told by people whose seasonal smiles were indelibly fixed on their faces. No, this was not what we used to call a beautiful scene from a Courier and Ives Christmas print. Like many, if not most of us, the people in this story failed to live up to that perfect notion of what Christmas is supposed to be. Joseph, we're told, wanted to do the right thing by the young girl, Mary, to whom he was engaged. Yet all of a sudden, his fiance was pregnant. And Joseph didn't do it. <laughs> he heard from Mary what he may have thought was a fantastic story about her having been made pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did, he, did, did Joseph buy it? At first, he was really uncertain about the cause of Mary's pregnancy. He feared that his fiance had been unfaithful to him and he was gonna put her away quietly. Then and now, that was adultery. But Joseph wasn't gonna make a big thing of it. How could he believe her? How? Joseph was engaged in the ultimate of struggles. Little did he know that the struggle he was in was for the nurture of the one who would be the eternal God and who would come and be flesh and dwell among us. Little did he know. In the 1970s, the Swedish producer and director and writer Ingmar Bergman produced a six-part TV miniseries entitled Scenes from a Marriage. So popular was this series on Swedish television that Bergman later made it into a stage play. It's the story of a couple by the names of not Mary and Joseph, but interestingly enough, Mary Ann and Johan. Really? And as the story unfolds, the audience is swept into their acclaimed and near perfect marriage. We're just in awe of how well they get on with one another, how well they know one another. Yet as the plot develops, their perfect marriage unravels into an absolutely hellish situation of infidelity and betrayal that's marked with incredible sadness. Like Mary Ann and Joseph, Mary and Joseph's perfect intentions for their life together 
almost ended and were for a time not so perfect at all. However, in the Bergman story, Marianne and Johann never got back to their faithfulness, never got over to their betrayal of one another. In their lives together, Marianne and Johann reached the same decision point as had Mary and Joseph 20 centuries before. Yet, because Mary and Joseph chose to take a different path, a life path that they struggle to get to, of absolute trust beyond their absolute knowing, all these centuries later, our world has been radically altered. On a recent afternoon at Northwestern University, Dr. Alexandra Solomon, a recognized professor and researcher on the subject of marriage, was engaged in a seminar with her graduate students. The topic of the seminar was how to deal with talk therapy and how to practice it. She was leading them in that colloquy based upon the question of when will there be time in their lives for committed relationships? <coughs> Perhaps even a relationship that would lead to love. One male student, in trying to respond to the question, said, Growing up, there's an immense pressure from parents and other authority figures to focus on the self. It's hard to find time for relationships when the baseball team practices at 6.30 in the morning and school starts at 8.15, drama rehearsal is at 4.15 in the afternoon, and so on. A female student agreed and chimed in. She said she finds this attitude that love and relationships are secondary to academic and professional success. and that that secondariness is hard to shake. She stated, before it was, well, I need to finish school. Well, and next I'll need to get a practice as a therapist, and then I'll need to do this, and then I'll need to do that, and by the time I get around to love, I don't know when. But by 30, we wake up and we're like, what is love? What's it like to be in a loving relationship outside of your family? What's it like to absolutely commit the time, the effort, and energy to be in a loving relationship? Or are we too busy trying to follow and meet the lofty, unrealistic, cultural expectations we have set for one another? so committed that there's little time for, as is stated by the female student, a loving relationship outside of our families. Joseph and Mary, but particularly Joseph, were caught up in the same conundrum. Do we follow the cultural norms of our society, the norms our society has set for us, or do we commit to one another and hope to find love? Today, living in the midst of a culture that at the very best promotes the narrative of a nostalgic birth in a pristine stable, we've forgotten the story of Mary and Joseph. We've forgotten that that story is nothing short of scandalous. Most of us are too much like Joseph, I think, to, who wanted to do the minimally upsetting thing, and leave Mary in the care of her parents in her home where she could quietly have that baby, which wasn't his. In the small town of Nazareth where everybody knew one another, where Mary and her family lived, Joseph wanted to do the right thing, though, according to the rules and norms of his culture. For Joseph, doing the right thing meant that he would have to address the fact that Mary had simply violated the important moral rule that she really shouldn't be pregnant when she gets married. This was a huge problem. To begin with, I can only imagine how initially Mary took the news that she was 
pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, I, I know, we know of Mary's response which we have recorded in our litur liturgies, in our litur liturgical canticles, which we know as the Magnificat, you know it. My soul doth magnify the Lord. I don't for a moment doubt that that's a response that Mary had. But I for one believe that her initial response was much more likely to have been less holy and sacred. Teenage Mary may have responded, Really? You've got to be kidding me, God. For both Mary and Joseph, the expectations of their culture were running headlong into the conflict of God's call to them. And that was the problem. How could Mary and Joseph get beyond their doubts? Their doubts of and about one another to rebuild their relationship. What had to happen? Later, Joseph, after a dreamlike angelic visitation, the Holy Spirit's origin of Mag Mary's pregnancy is confirmed to him. The angel admonishes Joseph, Joseph, let go of your fear, man. Fear of the emerging scandal, which was no doubt a fear which was eating him alive from within. A fear or a season of life that he couldn't shake. In the Bible, from time to time, there are people who make absolutely pivotal, complete change in life moves in which they turn from serving themselves and their own needs to, and serving the dictates of culture to serving the needs of God's people, almost like the Apostle Paul when he was on the road to Damascus and found faith and was given his sight, Joseph likewise makes a pivotal decision to turn from the expectations of culture and continue his life journey with Mary and the child she was carrying. Joseph's decision would have eternal consequences. Joseph decided to take Mary as his spouse to live out his love for her and to be as much of an earthly father as he possibly could to their son. This child, this holy child whom Mary carried already had a name. Emmanuel, God with us. Though the heavenly parent may be the Holy Spirit during Jesus' life, especially during his early years, the only earthly father Jesus ever knew was Joseph. Let's not forget that. We all know about the formative years of a child's life and how influential the parents can be in that child's life for the child's development. Perhaps the most formative influence that a parent can have upon a child is making the decision to love unconditionally whatever happens. The care and nurture of a child, even when that care and nurture is required at 2 o'clock in the morning, is essential. Given what we know about the man into whom Jesus grew, I believe we can be assured that for him, the love of earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, was more than ample. Though we know much about the succeeding chapters of Jesus' life and how he came to save us, I think it's important for us to explore this simple story today of Mary and Joseph. Two people become one, as we say in marriage, and the loving decisions both of them had to make. Those decisions were made for one another, for the child whom they would raise, and certainly for all of us centuries later. Little did they know it. I have a friend who for a long period of his life stu struggled with addictions. Finally, he got clean and sober. He learned about God's guidance in his life, <clears throat> and he likes to quote to me and other people a passage from the Psalms of David. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. My friend says, that though he believes this to be absolutely true, the light 
really only shines so far down the path, only as far as the next step. And when you step beyond the lighted path into the darkness of the unknown, you're stepping on faith. You're stepping out on faith. You're acting on faith. We walk by faith and not by, we say sight, but in this case by light. Joseph and Mary were challenged to trust and to walk by faith far beyond where the light of certainty illuminated their path. As in early marriage, the early marriage story of Joseph and Mary, God calls us to rise to rise to the calling God has for us, even when we know not where the journey will take us or where that path God has set before us will take us. Shortly, several of our St. Cyprian's people and one from Grace Yorktown will gather around me at the baptismal font right over there for the confirmation of their baptismal vows, to be received into this branch of the Christian faith, or to reaffirm their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are one of those who's gonna be either confirmed, received, or to renew your faith commitment, as you're able, I ask you to stand. As you're able. I know, from our earlier conversation this morning that not only are you affirming your commitment to follow Jesus but you're also saying you're going to be giving yourself over to loving relationships with Jesus Christ and other Christ followers and though I can give you the faithful assurance that as you surrender yourself to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's going to be with you. That's about as far down the path that I, or for that matter, any of us can see. We can't see beyond the, faith, the step where it takes faith to step out. I don't know where your life journey is going to take you. However, I do know that like Mary and Joseph, you will at times be called to live by faith and not by sight. My friends, to follow this path is to embark upon your journey with our Lord Jesus. It's the same journey that all of you will reaffirm this morning with them, with me will reaffirm that we are called by Jesus Christ, called to walk by faith and not by sight, called to walk where Mary and Joseph were called to walk, in a place where they were less than certain, in a life where at times they had not a clue about where it was going. But yet, their faithfulness is the example today for us of why we're here. For if they hadn't, we wouldn't be here. Thanks be to God that they were faithful. Thanks be to God that these six people will come forth and publicly affirm their faith in the risen Lord Jesus. And thanks be to God that all of you will reaffirm your faith with them.